There was a time when the financial world marveled at the genius of Charles Ponzi, the man who was in charge of one of the most successful business investments in America. He had millions of dollars at his disposal and crowds of people lining up literally begging him to take their money. Little did everyone know that Ponzi's business was built on nothing but lies. The whole thing was an outrageous scam. Or one which turned Ponzi into a very rich man but ruined the lives of thousands of innocent people. Ponzi's deception was so shocking and infamous that even now, a hundred years later, the scam still shares his name, the Ponzi scheme. This video is the untold truth of the man behind the scam. Charles Ponzi was born in Italy on 3rd March 1882. His father was a hard-working postman and overall his family was financially comfortable but it used to be much more than that. Ponzi's grandparents and great-grandparents had all been successful businessmen, merchants and public officials. The demotion to the working class really affected Ponzi from a young age and made him bitter and resentful. He wondered why he had to suffer for his family's failing fortune, why he couldn't have been more rich and enjoy a life of leisure without having to worry about a job or money. As a teenager, Ponzi inherited a modest sum of money following his father's death. He used it to enroll in college as his mother had her heart set on him going to a prestigious college to get an education. But Ponzi had other plans. Instead of studying and going to class, he decided to burn through his savings by dressing in the latest fashions and eating at the fanciest restaurants in town. Then at night, maybe the theater or the opera or some gambling at the casino with his wealthy friends. Nothing was too extravagant or too expensive for him. Ponzi liked to pretend that he was just like his rich friends and that he had endless money. But it was an illusion. And one day, it all came crashing down around him. His inheritance money finally ran out, and since his studies has been completely neglected, he had no chance of graduating. His uncle offered him work as a clerk, but the idea of finding a 9-to-5 job repulsed Ponzi, who considered himself too good for normal labor. He felt he had only one chance left to travel to America and strike it rich there. In 1903, Ponzi arrived in Boston around the SS Vancouver. He felt a deep shame in his heart that he left his mother down and believed that the only way to redeem himself was to return to Italy as a rich man. The only problem was he had no idea how to do that. America proved to be a much-needed reality check for young Ponzi. There was no more inheritance money and no more relatives to bail him out of trouble. As distasteful as he found physical labor, he had no choice. If he wanted to eat, he needed to work. Ponzi spent the next few years up and down the East Coast from New York to Florida. He worked as a sign painter, a waiter, a grocery clerk, a dishwasher, a factory hand, an insurance salesman, a sewing machine repair man. None of the gigs lasted long enough. Ponzi either quit because he hated the work or he was fired because he tried to cheat the customers. This often meant her resorted to stealing or begging for scraps of food and sleeping in parks. It was a far cry from his carefree days as a high roller back in Rome. And even when Ponzi did manage to scrap together a bit of cash, he would inevitably spend it all on a big night out of a, on, a, on a weekend vacation to remind himself of the good old days. In 1907, Ponzi traveled to Montreal, hoping that Canada would prove to be more welcoming and lucrative. And at first, things were looking up for him. He found work as a clerk at a bank that mainly served Italian immigrants called Banco Zarossi. It was the same time type of job that Ponzi had written down back in Rome because he considered himself too good for it. But it was surprising how a few years on the streets working for minimum wage could change his perspective. Unfortunately for Ponzi, his new job did not last long because his boss was a con man. Zerossi was using an age-old fraud known as robbing Peter to pay Paul. In other words, he was using the money from his newest clients in order to pay off his older ones. This allowed Zerossi to 
offer 6% interest rates on all deposits, which was double the average rate. However, his clients started getting suspicious when their relatives back home kept complaining that they were not receiving the money the bank was supposed to send. In mid-1908, the authorities began investigating the bank for embezzlement, at which point Zerosi filled a suitcase with all the cash he would carry and filed to Mexico, leaving his employees and his family to deal with the fallout from his scam. Not wanting to be the one who takes the fall, Ponze intended to travel back to the United States so he didn't have to be involved in the investigation and fallout from Zerosi's scam. But before that, he did something very stupid so that he would not have to start from scratch again. He thought that he would give himself a little going away present by forging a check from one of his bank's clients, a shipping firm called the Canadian Warehouse Company. Ponze stole a bank check from the manager's checkbook and filled it out for $423, a believable and unsuspicious amount through Ponze. But as soon as he tried to cash the fraudulent check, the bank teller easily spotted the fake signal and alerted the police. Ponze got three years in prison at St. Vincent de Paul Penitentiary. But of course, this was just the start of Ponze's crime. Ponze was released on parole after two years and he immediately made plans to travel to the States again. But he didn't go alone. Instead, he took with him five Italian immigrants, all fresh off the boat without any proper papers as he had been paid to smuggle these men into America. Ponze figured this would set him up with a nice quick payday now that he was a free man again. However, he got caught and was arrested once again. Still, Ponze hoped that if he pled guilty, the judge would go easy on him and let him off with a small fine. But once the judge banged his gavel and passed sentence, Ponze's heart sank. He was given another two years in a federal prison in Atlanta. After being released from jail for a second time, Ponze was unsure of his next move. He had come up with all these different plans to get rich while in prison, but they all required money and Ponze was penniless. Therefore, with little choice, he wandered from state to states again, working whatever odd jobs came his way. Ultimately, he found a decent position as a clerk with an import-export business called the J.R. Pole Company in Boston. So, after a decade and a half in North America, he ended up in the same place where he began. Life in Boston was decidedly better for Ponzi the second time around, though he was good at his job for a change and was promoted for it. Not just that, but Ponzi met 21-year-old Rose Nico and instantly fell head over heels for her. The first time they spoke, Ponzi was so nervous that he could barely string two words together. Fortunately, for him, the feeling was mutual, and the two got married early 1918. His new married life made Ponze feel happy, but he also felt inadequate. Even though Rose was content with a simple life, Ponze had much grander ambitions. He wanted to be able to shower her with diamond rings, fancy clothes, and expensive holidays. Obviously, this was never going to happen on a clerk's salary. So, six months after the wedding, Ponze quit his steady job at J.R. Pole and began looking for something new to do. He started off by joining his father-in-law's wholesale fruit selling business. The company was struggling and since Ponce always bragged to his wife about being a financial genius, this was the time for him to show everyone what he can do. However, Ponce was unable to save the failing. Undeterred by his recent failure, Ponce rented a small office to start his own import and export business, but the world at large took no notice of him. Ponce lacked the experience and the contacts to attract any serious business. However, Ponce refused to believe he was the problem and thought that maybe he just needed to advertise his services more. Unfortunately, a few quick calculations made him realize that the costs were well outside his reach. Just like that, Ponce's import and export business became another failure venture. The only silver line for Ponze was this failure had already given him his new idea. When Ponze saw how much money it would cost him to publicize his services, he thought that maybe he should publish his own trade magazine so that other companies would pay him the same kind of giant advertising fees. Ponze had zero experience when it came to 
publishing but in this mind this was already a million dollar business idea he would call his magazine the trader's guide and he would send it for free to 1 lakh companies doubling the circulation number with each new issue according to ponzi's calculations his initial mailing work cost him around $35,000 but he would make $80,000 in advertising income since he was certain that companies would be lining up around the block to publicize their services in his mag- Magazine. Certain of success, Ponzi rented a much larger office and hired three staff members. And then he began writing, a writing, a writing to investors and business owners about the possibility of getting involved with the first ever issue of the Trader's Guide. Then reality came crashing down on Ponzi like a ton of bricks. Nobody was interested. Nobody cared about his obscure little trade magazine, and they certainly were not willing to pay his exorbitant rates to get. featured in it then when ponze went to his local bank to get a loan because he was almost out of money he got another harsh dose of reality when the bank president refused his applications on the spot telling him that he would rather close ponze's account than loan him a single dollar these were bitter pills to swallow for ponze and left with little choice he had to fire his staff and settle his office space to earn some money but his dreams and ambitions remained remained as powerful as ever and Ponzi hoped that his next idea would be the one that would make him rich. One day in August 1919, Ponzi was going through his mail when he spotted a letter from Spain back when he still thought that the trader's guide would become the next big thing in advertising. Ponzi was not content with simply doing business in America. He, he envisioned that his guide would be translated into French, German, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese and that he would expand his business into Europe. And thus he would contact in many foreign companies about the possibility of doing business together and it seems that at least one of them was interested. The Spanish author of the letter requested a copy of the trader's guide and to pay for postage. He included something that Ponce had never seen before, an international reply coupon or IRC. IRCs were prepaid coupons that could be bought and exchanged for postage stamps in any country that was a member of the Universal Postal Union. They were commonly used by people who sent letters internationally to cover the cost of a return letter when they were not expecting the other person to pay the postage. But for Ponce, they were a bolt of inspiration and were about to change his life forever. Years earlier, Ponzi had learned about the concept of arbitrage, the strategy of buying and selling an asset in different markets in order to take advantage of the price difference and make a profit. In the case of IRCs, they were always exchanged for the same postage value regardless of the country, but they were purchased at slightly different prices, depending on fluctuations in the local currency. So in theory, Ponzi could buy an IRC in Italy, where the lira had taken a serious hit after the war. and then redeem it in the United States for American postage stamps where he knew the dollar value would be slightly higher. He would then sell these stamps and make a tiny profit. Then by scaling the operation to thousands, even millions of IRCs, he was looking at some serious money. This was Ponce's new business plan and on paper it seemed not only like a good idea but also perfectly legal. Arbitrage was a sound investment tactic that had been in the Jews for centuries. So in January 1920 Ponze started investment tactic a new company to handle what seemed to be his most promising business venture yet and he called it the securities exchange company. Unfortunately for Ponze, like many times before reality came in to crash his hopes and dreams, the truth was that the profits from the arbitrage of IRCs were so small that they would be completely wiped out by the cost of shipping the IRCs from one country to another. They literally were not enough IRCs in the entire world to sustain the kind of operation that Ponze was imagining and yet he refused to let go of this idea. Ponze was convinced 
convinced that this was his golden goose, his one-way ticket to the life of wealth and luxury that he always felt he deserved. So when the legitimate business proved unsustainable, he turned his idea into the infamous Ponzi scheme that shares his name. After all, his plan to arbitrage IRC sounded really good, so even though it actually wasn't good at all, maybe he could convince other people it would work and take their money. It involves getting people to invest in a business opportunity by promising them huge returns in a short amount of time with little to no risk. However, their money never really gets invested. Instead, the fraud setter keeps most of it for themselves whilst giving some of the profit to earlier investors. When these early investors see such large returns, most of them agree to reinvest their profits back into the business to make even more money, thinking it all seems to be working as advertised. Many of them even tell other people about the opportunity as they believe the earnings are perfectly legitimate. But in reality, all that's happening is those earlier investors are getting paid using some of the money from new investors. It is a very simple but effective system that preys on people's greed and financial naivety, but it requires a constant flow of new funds in order to keep the scam going. As soon as the fraudster can't find enough new investors to pay off the returns to his old investors, the con usually falls apart. Using his system, Ponzi offered investors a staggering 50% return in 45 days or 100% return in 90 days. He claimed to have a vast network of agents all over the world who are buying IRCs in bulk and shipping them to America. If pressed for any details on his operation, Ponze would refuse to divulge any information, simply claiming that he couldn't share all the details of how exactly it worked, as then it could potentially help his competition. Most banks, companies, and serious investors stayed away from Ponze. They knew when something was too good to be true, and in fact, almost anyone who knew a thing or two about finances could tell that it was impossible for Ponze to deliver on his promises, but they were not the one that Ponze targeted. He wanted the people who used to be just like him, with more dreams than common sense, who were always looking for the best way to get rich quick. This meant he prayed. The people with very little financial literacy, often people in desperate need of money first. Ponzi understood that his true talent was not dealing with finances, but dealing with people. He knew how to sell his business without appearing too eager or aggressive, as if it made no difference to him whether he got their money or not. Ponzi started out with the people in his own neighborhood and got 18 of them to invest in his first month. Once they were all paid their first round of profits, Word started spreading fast and soon thousands of people began crowding the streets outside Ponzi's office desperate to invest their own money in this seemingly surefire opportunity. Month after month, Ponzi gained more and more clients ranking in over $250,000 million a day at the peak of his operation. The Boston Post hailed him as a financial genius which gave him yet more perceived credibility and thus more investors. Soon, Ponze was finally able to live the life that he had always dreamed of. He moved into a giant mansion, bought a fast car, dressed only in expensive clothes, wore gold watches and diamond paints, and went on lavish first-class trips. It was the lifestyle that Ponze always felt he deserved, but he didn't get to enjoy it for long. By the start of the summer, less than six months after Ponze launched his new venture, there were rumblings of doubt about his business. Initially, everyone was was afraid to say anything since Ponzi had successfully sued a financial analyst for Liebel who would accuse Ponzi of lying. After all, many early investors had been paid already which Ponzi said was a proof everything was legitimate. But then the Post and Post, the same newspaper that once proclaimed Ponzi a genius, started to investigate his operation. They brought in Clarence Barron, president of Dow Jones and manager of the Wall Street Journal, who spotted the obvious scheme. But his calculations, Ponzi would have needed to purchase 160 million IRCs, and yet there were only 27,000 in circulation in the whole world. But in July 1920, the post-president Barron's can 
conclusions on the front page of the newspaper decrying ponzi as a fraud and prompting an investigation into his company but the wheels of justice turned slowly and ponzi was able to ease the concerns of government officials by cooperating fully and even saying he would stop taking in new investments while he was under scrutiny but then ponzi caused his own downfall by hiring william mcmasters as his publicist unlike ponzi mcmaster was an honest man who soon realized that his client was a fraud he later said ponzi is a financial idiot with access to ponzi's records mcmasters collected the evidence he needed and went to the post and post where he wrote a pulitzer prize winning expose detailing all of ponzi's secrets this time the game was really up and the ponzi scheme collapsed several banks had to declare bankruptcy tens of thousands of people lost their life savings and ponzi himself was in indicated on 86 counts of mail fraud however the con man managed to strike a deal and pleaded guilty to only a single charge of mail fraud receiving just 5 years in federal prison a relatively small amount giving the huge amount of money stolen and the vast amount of lives he ruined ponze was released after 3 and a half years in prison He literally tried a new scam immediately after getting released. Ponzi knew that the government wanted to either deport him to Italy or imprison him again on larceny charges. So he fled to Florida where he planned to essentially repeat the Ponzi scheme again. This time though there were no takers. Ponzi's fraud was soon exposed and he risked being sent to Massachusetts. where a lengthy sentence awaited him not wanting to go back to prison yet again ponzi changed his look and tried to travel to italy as a sailor aboard a cargo ship however he was recognized and arrested in new orleans ponzi was now a desperate man he wrote to president for mercy he even appealed to mussolini to intervene on his behalf but of course nobody listened it was the end of the line for him ponzi served another 7 years in prison and the man who came out was not the same as the one who went in ponzi was a broken mess who had lost all the charm and confidence that once made him so rich as he faced deportation to italy his wife chose to stay behind in america and divorced him Ponzi spent the rest of his years in poverty with only memories to comfort him of the times when he had it all. He ended up in Rio de Janeiro where he died in 1949 in a charity hospital and was buried in a pauper's grave. The springing an end to one of the most notorious tales of race to riches to rage in history. So that was all about the Ponzi scam. For another informative video or a famous personality, subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon. Till then, bye bye.